Um, first of all, uh, welcome everyone. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, uh, good evening from uh, wherever you are joining. My name is George Tassaronis. I'm Vice President of Data Science uh, for Research Content uh, in Elsevier. And today we're going to be talking to you about a couple of technologies we have developed with uh, state-of-the-art uh, machine learning techniques for supporting um, the fighting of the COVID, uh, COVID pandemic that broke out in 2020. Uh, and without further ado, let's proceed uh, to some of the main content. So today I'm joined with uh, two of my colleagues. Uh, you will meet them in a moment, Zubair Raftal, uh, Director of Data Science uh, in our department, and also Ephemios uh, Tsakonas, um, who is Senior Machine Learning Scientist and Manager of Data Science in our department as well. Uh, just a very quick flash intro of Excuse who we me, are. George. So we are uh, George, yeah, I'm so sure. sorry to stop you. Excuse me. Uh, we just have uh, no one more minute of a break. Ah, I'm so sorry. My for apologies. The I didn't realize. Standing. No worries at all. I'm so sorry. No worries at all. Uh, just absolutely. one more minute, no if you don't mind. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. We can start from here. We can resume from here when people are back. Great. Uh, I think Cliff will come on yes. and uh, he'll launch us. Thanks so much. Okay, well, let me let me welcome everybody back from the break. Um, and uh, for those of you who got a very quick preview um, during the break, uh, you'll you'll hear most of that again. Uh, bear with us. Um, but uh, I'm delighted to welcome um, welcome a team uh, from uh, Elsevier, led by George um, Tosaronis. I think I did not do too much violence to that. Um, if so, I apologize. Um, this is a really timely topic um, in, in the sense that um, the pandemic has produced this incredible flood of information and the scholarly publishing apparatus has struggled in so many ways to deal with this. Um, uh, we're gonna hear about a number of tools and tactics that Elsevier has been experimenting with. And um, I think, interestingly, this will form a little bit of a complement as well, perhaps with the uh, first talk we heard at this. And without further ado, uh, let me turn it over to, um, to George and his colleagues uh, and take it away from there. Really many thanks, Cliff and Diane and Paige for having us today. So welcome everyone. Uh, good afternoon, uh, good morning or good evening from wherever you are joining. Um, I'm accompanied uh, today here with two of my colleagues, Zubair Aftal and Efimio Sakonas that uh, you will meet in a moment. I'm George Tsatsaronis, Vice President Data Science of Research Content in Elsevier. And today we would like to demonstrate a couple of technologies that we have developed. Uh, uh, to help the research communities combat or fight the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, but first, just a flash introduction of who we are. Uh, so Elsevier, probably you know uh, mostly as a publisher, uh, but next to our publishing business, uh, we have also uh, grown a large global information analytics piece, uh, primarily serving research and academic communities, but also corporate markets in the space of uh, research applications, health and life sciences. Uh, so basically what we are envisaging to achieve is to help the communities we serve uh, to progress the science to advance uh, the spaces they are working at and uh, to help the communities in general uh, get the most out of the uh, get the most insights out of the research content and uh, what we offer is basically a unique combination of content not only Elsevier content we as you will see in the next uh, in the next uh, slides of the presentation we work with uh, a number of uh, partners and other resources. Uh, so just a few things about that. Uh, we've had in the past um, in a, with our data science community, which is a very uh, vivid community of 250 plus experts in machine learning, uh, NLP, uh, data science in general, a number of uh, very successful research collaborations with universities around the globe. Uh, some examples are recently with Harvard, uh, in the past, Imperial College, University of Melbourne, and many others. Um, 
Uh, just to give you an indication that we are not only implementing solutions, but are also doing uh, cutting-edge research within our um, remit. Uh, just in 2021, together with our colleagues from the AI lab we have with the University of Amsterdam and Freie Universität, uh, we published one of the um, latest advances on how to basically query and mine knowledge graph, which received one of the outstanding paper awards at the ICLR, a 2021 conference. This is one of the main conferences for machine learning uh, in the area of deep learning uh, in the recent years. So without further ado, let me introduce you to today's topic. Uh, so uh, today we will be talking about some of the things Elsevier has done to help the community uh, to combat uh, the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, since the outset of the pandemic, one of the first things we did uh, was to put together uh, a very comprehensive a resource directory, uh, the Elsevier's Coronavirus Resource Directory, which is publicly uh, available, pointing and having uh, more than 80,000 full text articles accessible on COVID-19 and to various other tools that can help professionals, academics, uh, clinicians, but also researchers alike uh, to, to, to aggregate, uh, if you may, necessary information and facts about uh, the virus and the pandemic itself. So uh, with that, I will pass it on to my colleague Zubair, who will introduce you to one of our two solutions that we would like to present today. Oh, thank you, George, and hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Zubair Afzal. Uh, today, I will be talking briefly about one of the use cases, the COVID-19 use cases that we have at Elsewhere, which is about identifying what we call the core or the primary COVID-19 articles. So. As you know, ever since the pandemic uh, broke, uh, the whole research communities and industry and the government, they all uh, work together, the joint forces in order to combat. And the key advancement uh, actually in this area is, uh, is to ensure the fast, efficient, peer-reviewed communication of any novel research finding. So elsewhere, at Elsewhere, we implemented uh, the acceleration initiative uh, with the objective to identify what we call the primary COVID-19 article. I'll come back to this uh, in the next slide, but what, what, what does it mean? So to identify these articles so they can be shared with the scientific community as soon as possible. And of course, all our COVID um, uh, catalog is available on Science Direct and on, on, on Elsevier Novel Coronavirus Information Center page for free. Uh, we also contribute uh, to the COVID-19 data set uh, through the PMC, which is COVID-19 is the largest research data set out there on the COVID-19. And of course, we also contribute uh, to the COVID-19 articles uh, to the uh, WHO uh, catalog. So uh, when we started uh, this task, uh, that was back in uh, March 2020, uh, we wanted to we have we have wanted to have a, a method to identify core 19 articles uh, and made them available for free but at that time we could not implement machine learning because they, we needed a training set to to create uh, to build a machine learning model but we did not have any so naturally we started off with, with a very simple approach using keywords so this is the initial uh, keywords that our subject matter experts uh, came up with to identify any relevant article so all articles that had one of these terms were identified and the, all of them, they were first made available on our coronavirus information center page and also on the science track page uh, for all the research uh, for all the community. So uh, soon we re realized that this keyword list was rather short, it's not extensive. So in the next version, we, we expanded our, our terminology, we added many more relevant keywords, also a combination of keywords that we thought were useful to identify such articles. As you can imagine uh, from uh, this type of keyword queries that uh, they usually have very high recall. That means they will catch uh, any relevant articles, but they will also uh, generate a lot of false positive uh, or the noise. So we wanted to, just to give you an example, so here, here are a few articles, uh, recent articles. And if you look at the title, all, all, uh, all title have at least one of the keywords present in them, which I have highlighted. But if you look closely, the articles on the left, they don't really talk about the coronavirus, you know, or, uh, you know, its diagnosis or, or the treatment, but they talk about, you know, the gambling at the time of COVID-19 or the supply chain resilience, uh, 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 fact how to optimize that, you know, but the article on the right, 
if you look closely, it has more uh, information that suggests that these are the articles that actually talk about the coronavirus, uh, coronavirus and uh, you know the treatment and, and the vaccination. So we wanted to uh, build a machine learning classifier that can learn to distinguish between these two sets of uh, sets of articles. So the articles on the right are what we call the primary impact article, and on the left is what we call the secondary impact article. Now, this the the the, the task was clear that this is what we wanted to do, but. Uh, what we did uh, before we continued, before we started with machine learning, we interviewed uh, our clinicians and, and, and bioinformaticians and even scientists and researchers to gather their information need. So based on the interviews that we, we actually came up with this following inclusion and exclusion criteria. So, so the top one uh, uh, is inclusion criteria for the primary impact article. So any article, you know, all articles that talk about diagnosis, treatment, vaccine development, articles, you know, talk about other type of coronaviruses, how the hospitals are handling the pandemic, population related phenomena, what the impact of the, the COVID-19 on the healthcare system. So we all group them into what we call the primary impact articles. So all other articles, you know, articles that talk about uh, the impact of COVID-19 on economy, education, transport, social media, and all, uh, we group them in the secondary impact article. So now we had the definition, but we still did not have a training set to actually build a machine learning classifier. So, uh, you know, any any supervised machine learning uh, classification, you need some training training set that you could use to train your train your algorithm. But we did not have any based on uh, the criteria that we came up with. So, what we did, we we use active learning to actually generate uh, a test set. And active learning, if you don't know, is a, is, a, is a subdomain in in machine learning. So where so typically when you are creating a training set, what you do is you take a random sample from your whole population and then you ask your subject matter expert to label them. Now the quality of the, of the annotation also depends on your sampling, how good your sampling was, whether all the samples were actually useful for the, for the algorithm. So with active learning, uh, the, it's not you that decides what, what articles or what uh, you know, examples that needs to be labeled, but it's the algorithm that decides, okay, which article should we label so in order to maximize the effect of uh, the machine learning algorithm. So we use the active learning to, to create a, a training set, also a test set, and we used a large uh, pre-trained BioBert model. BioBert uh, is, is a very large uh, language model that is trained on uh, 4.5 billion words from PubMed and from 13.5 billion words uh, from the PMC. It's based on the on the bird architecture. So we, we took that uh, large language model and then we fine tuned it. We optimized the algorithm so it could identify the, you know, the articles that we call the primary and the secondary impact article. And we coupled this approach with the active learning to actually uh, speed up the whole process of uh, generating the algorithm while we are also building uh, the training set and the test set. So the Cora algorithm, so this, so our, we, we call our algorithm the, the Cora, the COVID-19 relevancy algorithm or Cora in short. So the algorithm has two components actually. It has the keyword based classifier. So, so it uses all the keywords that I shown, uh, I'm showing below. So the idea of using the keyword classifier is to ensure high recall. So we don't want, we didn't want to miss any any relevant articles. Uh, uh, so any article that has one of these keywords uh, will be will be picked up by this classifier. But as we already know that a lot of these, many of these articles are false positive. So then we apply our machine learning classifier, which then identifies the primary impact covert article. So when we apply the Cora, when we applied the Cora algorithm on the same set of articles that I showed earlier, so the algorithm actually uh, assigns a probability score to each of the each of the article. So we did not just use the title of the article uh, for, uh, to classify them. We used title and abstract of the article. So as you can see on the left, uh, the algorithm has scored probability, the maximum here is 0.46, uh, well below 0.5. So these articles were not classified as primary by the, by the algorithm. But on the right, as we, as we expected, 
these algorithm, the algorithm actually uh, gave them very high score. So this way we, we know that these are the articles that we wanted to, to capture and uh, uh, you know, uh, make them available uh, for free as soon as possible. Uh, just quickly on the, on the evaluation. So of course we, we evaluated the methodology, you know, how good the keyword classifier was and how good our Quora classifier was. So we use precision recall and upfront score uh, measure. So these are standard measures that uh, that we use in the in, in machine learning or in, in information retrieval. For people who don't know, precision precision actually is the is the fraction of uh, the correct articles uh, from all the articles that you identified. So in this case, when we look at 0.74, it means that uh, for every hundred articles that that were identified by the keyword classifier. 26 were actually false positive and the only the 74 were actually correct. Uh, recall is uh, also sometimes known as sensitivity is the fraction of correct documents from all the correct documents. So here uh, 98 means uh, for, for 100 correct articles, the, the keyword classifier identified 98 of them. This is what you would expect from, from, a, from a keyword classifier anyway, because it has all the general keywords present. Uh, F1 score is just the harmonic mean between the two, between precision and recall to get to one, one score. Uh, Core on the other hand had a uh, high precision, about uh, 0.89, but slightly lower recall, uh, which again is also, also expected. Keep in mind, uh, when you are doing the machine learning, uh, you always try to find a balance between precision and recall. You can actually optimize your algorithm to get high precision or high recall, but usually it uh, it comes at the cost of others. So if you want to uh, put more weightage on the precision, uh, then you'll have to sacrifice some recall and, and vice versa. So, but overall, as you can see, F1 score uh, was actually higher than the keyword classifier. So this is when we first deployed our machine learning model in production and started classifying uh, all the incoming, all the has drifted. So we applied the same keyword uh, classification on an article and uh, it turned out that the precision actually dropped actually quite a lot. You can see from going down from 0.74 to 0.36, that means you know for every 100 articles, only 36 were actually uh, correct uh, by the keyword classifier. Uh, the Quora had still very high precision and recall was even higher. So this just shows the uh, the advantage and the power of these language models that how how good they are over time in you know in identifying the, the variations in the language or people are using the terminology but still able to identify them with high precision and precision and recall so just to just to summarize uh, our contribution we we created a framework of inclusion and exclusion criteria that may be used as a generic guideline to annotate uh, core crop scientific publication. Uh, we also created uh, you know, simple but very efficient uh, deep active learning approach uh, with the help of our subject matter expert. By the way, the, the training and test set that we created through this process is also uh, available for free. So anyone can actually download this training set and, and train their own version of Quora if they will. Uh, we demonstrated via experimental evaluation that the algorithm achieves very high F1 score on detecting primary and secondary impact articles. Now at Elsevier, uh, the algorithm, Quora, is ensuring that we, we are identifying all primary impact articles as early as at the submission time, so they can be put on fast track uh, peer review and the publishing, uh, publishing process. So that was quickly the uh, first uh, use case. I will now hand it over to Timos, uh, who will then walk you through the second use case. Timos. Thank you very much, uh, Zubair and Zorn. So let, me, let me share my screen. Um, and I hope, I hope that you can all see my screen now. Yes, we can. Yeah. That's great. Um, so uh, first of all, I would like to thank you all very, very much uh, for, for attending this session. And uh, what I'm going to do is, um, is basically, I'm, I'm going to present a search engine, which um, we are going to apply to the so-called Code 19 dataset. 
And uh, I'm going to present the basic components of this engine. And, and CORD-19 is essentially a data set comprising literature around COVID-19 and uh, other coronaviruses. And it, it is actually continuously updated by the Allen AI Institute, among other organizations. Uh, Elsevier contrib contributes to, to this data set a lot, as Zubair and, and George just mentioned. Um, and, 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 th and that's essentially the data set that we're going to apply our solution to. Now, uh, in a modern search engine, there are a few basic components in, in cascade, if you will. So first of all, there is the, the so-called indexing component. That is the part where your query hits the index. And then uh, there are machine learning based components. It could be a learning to run component, as we say, or a question answering component, or it could be both. And in our case, the search engine that we developed specifically for this corpus, whose first page looks like this, actually, has all these three components. So that uh, when a user submits a query like that, for example, uh, and note here that the query is a question, like what is the effectiveness of chloroquine for COVID-19, uh, Indexing will retrieve very, very fast the bucket of candidate documents which are relevant to the query. Then this bucket of documents is going to be sent to the learning to rank and the question answering components. And then the results are mixed and returned back to the user. And the question answering component in particular um, I will attempt to provide relevant snippets to directly address the user's question. You, you, you can see these here. While in the, in the right-hand side, let's say this in gray, while the, the, the learning to run component will, will serve essentially the final relevant search results to the user, as you can see in the left-hand side here. And this will happen in real time. Now the user can then you know, click and, and, and see uh, you know, highlighted in yellow the possible answers to, to, to his or her questions. Now, how is this possible in real time? And uh, and let's just start with with a little with a little deep dive. And we can start with with basically indexing, which is the first component of our search engine, because indexing is essentially what makes search engines fast. So if you think about the way or the scale that Google works, for instance it becomes evident that you can't really do simple things, right? So you can take your query and compare it against every document that you have in your database. Uh, because you have millions of queries and millions of documents, this isn't going to scale. So you need something faster. And the basic data structure or the basic idea that we use to make things faster is the so-called inverted index. And the best way to think about what this is, is to think about the index at the back of a book. Right? So you have a book and in the back of it, what you have is a list of keywords. And next to each keyword, you have the, 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 the pages that, that talk about the, the keyword. And that is an example of a manually constructed index. Now, an inverted index that the search engine uses is very much uh, the same type of a data structure with the difference that in a search engine, you don't choose what words you're going to index. You are basically indexing everything. So you pick all words, and then you store pointers to all the documents that contain a mention of those words. And this is a nice data structure to have because it allows you for very quick retrieval of material. Because once you've looked into the index, essentially once you've looked into the page that contains a certain word that it's in the user's query, then you can jump straight to that page. So it, allow, it, it essentially allows you to find stuff in, in sublinear time. And this is just a simple example uh, that I have created to showcase the inverted index. And suppose that you have a collection of documents. It's really simple. It's just five documents like that, uh, D1, D5. And the inverted index actually pertaining to these documents is, is, is this one here, at least, at least part of this inverted index. So you have the terms here that are in your documents. These are serving you as the head of the inverted lists, as we say, and each term corresponds to an inverted list. And that's a list of tuples, which basically consists of a document ID 
together with the uh, number of times that the term appeared in that particular document ID. So essentially the term sport here, what this says that it appears in document number three one time and nowhere else, whereas the term he appears in every document twice in the first one and once in every other document. And the key point here is that uh, due to Due, due to Zip's law, which is essentially a law in statistics governing language, these inverted lists in their majority are going to be very, very sparse. So this data structure here allows for a very quick retrieval of material. Even if you have a multi-word query like, like that here, football pay, uh, what you can do is that you can pull up the inverted list for football, like that, and you can pull up the inverted list for pay, and by incrementing a couple of pointers, you can actually score the documents. And you can either have a Boolean score, like that, like if your all query terms are present, like match or no match, or you can have a, uh, a, a more sophisticated score taking into account the terms frequency in your query and your document. Right, and that's that's basic inverted index. And there are crazier things that you can further do with indexing, stuff like searching phrases, um, or uh, very recently, basically, um, uh, you are able to index numerical vectors, so as to retrieve very very fast the k nearest neighbors of a query vector from your index vectors. And people call this semantic indexing. Um, where one uses essentially numerical vectors to represent pieces of text in such a way that pieces of text that are semantically related are represented by numerical vectors that are closer in that vector space. And there are, of, cro of course, crazier things that you can do. And you can do all these things in conjunction with indexing. Um, we don't have the time to go through everything. What I would like to do now is talk a little bit about the learning to run component and the question answering components in, in a search engine. Um, so uh, what is essentially uh, the basic idea uh, behind learning to run? So what do we want to do? And this is basically uh, how a learning to run system performs in, in the forward step, if you allow. So if you assume that you have a query queue and you have a bunch of documents uh, that were returned from indexing, uh, and these are represented by uh, DI, and you want to find the most relevant ones. So what do you do? So the first step is essentially you create a joint, as we say in machine learning, a joint feature vector representation for your query and each of the documents. So for each, query and document pair, or your query Q and document I, you create the feature vector representation uh, X of I, right? And, uh, and, and, and then what you have is that you have a scoring function that you have learned to assign a score to this feature vector representation. And now that you have all the scores for the documents, you sort them in decreasing order and you feed them to, you, to the user. And the learn scoring function F that you see here is typically much more rich than the scoring functions used in indexing that we saw earlier, as they take into account the much richer set of features. Now, in learning to rank, there are basically three different categories that one can use to learn the scoring function. And by far the most popular approach, which is the approach that we also use, the so-called pairwise learning to rank. And in this case, you have data in the form of inequalities. For example, that this document A is more relevant than document B for query Q. And given such inequalities, you can estimate essentially the scoring function, right? And the data that we have used come from an open source data set from Semival 2010. I'm not gonna go into the details here. Instead, what I would like to do is an I would like to show you what we mean exactly by joint feature vector representation of query document pairs. You can see that schematically here. And what this means is that for each tuple query document, we extract our features. And here is a brief categorization of these features. So some of them are frequency-based features. Uh, for example, uh, counting the number of terms that are common between the query and the document 
or other similarity features like TFIDF or BM25, which are classical information retrieval. Other category of features are semantic features uh, coming from word embeddings, for example. Um, and another category has to do with positional features. Namely, you split your document into zones like title, abstract, and perhaps other paragraphs. And you compute essentially frequency-based features and semantic features on, on, on these zones in, in your document, right? Excuse me, Atiomis, uh, we have one more minute. Yeah, absolutely. Now we can talk a little bit about question answering, which is basically a feature of the entire search experience. So uh, the top 20 score documents coming out of the learning to run component are fed as an input to the question answering component which attempts to directly address the user question. And let me just stress that the performance of the question answering component crucially hinges on the performance of the learning to run component. Now, question answering may sound complicated, but today it's actually pretty easy to get a state-of-the-art model by doing the following. You can take a pre-trained language model like BERT here, which is a very sophisticated language model. And you can fine tune this pre-trained model for question answering by feeding it a small amount of data for your application. And in our case, the fine tuning was performed through approximately 2000 question and answer pairs for COVID-19. And this will get you pretty much state of the art performance. And here we actually use a variation of, of, of BERT, giving us an input, a question and a passage, and as a target output, start and, and end token classifier. Now each classifier has its own set of weights, which essentially are used to pinpoint the start and end token for your answer at inference time. And what's actually important here is how you choose essentially to mix learning to rank and question answering results and feed them back to the user to keep him engaged like that. Because here by user clicks, we can actually utilize the user feedback to further fine tune our models. And this is actually very important when you design a search, search engine or search engine system. Thank you very much. That's, that's all I had to say. Well, thank you. Um, very if interesting. We have some time for questions. Happy to take one or two questions, or we can also take them uh, offline. And we will obviously share this deck of information with the audience here. Uh, very happy to do so. Yes, I, I think we probably have time for a quick question. If there is one, um, please jump in. I don't see one leaping up. Um, I think there was a lot in there for people to absorb, and uh, I hope you'll be able to stay around at least for a little bit and perhaps field a couple of questions through chat. Um, that was really very, that was a very interesting presentation. And so th I thank you very much for sharing that work with us. Thank you very much. And I'll be thank happy. you for having us. Thank you for having us.